Because even at my deepest, darkest moment, there weren't loved ones in my life who were saying, Larry, you got this. You've got the good. You can do this. Go get them, champ. No, what they were saying is, why are you doing this? Why are you putting us through this? Don't you think you need to go get a job kind of thing, right? So be careful who you surround yourself with, I guess is my message. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of I Know This Guy, a podcast where we dive deep into the lives of some of the most interesting people I know. Before we get started, please like and subscribe to I Know This Guy, wherever you get your podcasts. By the way, my kids want me to say something about ringing a bell. What the hell's a bell? So, Dad, who do we have lined up for the podcast today? Well, before we get into that, Hade, I wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, Matt Shedd. Matt's been a previous guest, and he's also just sent over a couple of great guests. So just wanted to say thank you, Matt. Yeah, and make sure if you haven't heard his episode yet to go back and listen to it. It's uh, definitely one of my favorites. Yeah, it's also one of the uh, top viewed. So... Who did Matt recommend? Yeah, so today we're going to be talking to Larry Broughton. He's a hotelier. He's a CEO. He's an incredible entrepreneur. He's a public speaker. And he was a former Green Beret. So I'm sure we're going to get a ton of interesting stories out of him. Wow, that's that's a whole lot to handle. Uh, can't wait to hear what he has to say. So welcome, Larry, to the podcast. But before we get started, I got to tell you, I'm a little bit intimidated. You've been everywhere. You've done a ton of TV shows. You've done a ton of podcasts. And, uh, you know, not only that, you're a top entrepreneur. You're a hotelier or hotelier in the U.S., CEO, best-selling author, keynote speaker, and a U.S. Uh, Army Green Beret. So, yeah, I'm a little intimidated. <laughs> well, I'm intimidated by your darn beard, Norm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if that's all it takes. <laughs> I aspire to be you one day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? This is great. This is really great to have you on the podcast. The, the whole reason why we put out this podcast is to reach out to interesting people. And we we did it basically over a cigar, you know, and three phone calls came in. And we were trying to you know, just basically I was saying, oh, yeah, I, I know this guy. Oh, yeah, I know this guy. And anyways... Two of our guests, so it started out with Melissa Simonson, went to Isabella Hamilton. She introduced me to Matt Shedd, and Matt introduced me to you. And so Matt blew me away, but he says, you want to talk to somebody interesting, you got to talk to you. So, <laughs> so it's perfect. Well, Matt, Matt is an interesting guy. Yeah. Well, I love, I love the concept of the show because haven't we all had that? We're sitting around, whether it's smoking a cigar, having a glass of wine, drinking a beer, Right. And it's, we've all got that experience. I know this guy, whether it's a guy or a girl. And um, so I, I love the concept. When Matt shared that with me, I thought, wow, that's awesome. I want to be there. So oh, that, funny that's enough, great. <laughs> they're going to be reaching out to you. <laughs> Perfect. And you know, it's interesting because like for me, I have a, I don't know, probably a 30 year network and that's probably my best asset. It, it takes time. You go out there, you meet people. And, you know, you share that, you know, you, you, if you can, and that happens almost once a day. I don't know about you, but, you know, the network, the network is my asset. Anyways, I'd like to, you know, get right into your backstory and, you know, just find out exactly, you know, Larry, what makes Larry you? Gosh, what makes me me? That's a great question. I don't know that I've ever been asked that, but I think that what it is is I have a way of digging deep and fighting when it seems like I ought to be given up. I look over and over at my life. I've had plenty of failures. In fact, I've had a whole lot more failures in my life than I've had successes when you know, most normal people, I guess you would say, say, why don't you quit? Why don't you give up? Why don't you try something else? Uh, for some reason, that fuels me, and I dig a little bit deeper, and I tend to figure out a way to, to get through it. I'm an eternal optimist. 
Um, I tend to be able to see the good in people and in situations. Don't get me wrong. There is evil in the world um, for sure. But I tended, I recognize, maybe it's from my martial arts days way back when, in my late teens and early 20s. There's, you know, the yin and yang. There's a little bit of evil and all good and a little bit of good and all evil. And I'm constantly looking for the good. I'm constantly looking for the potential in situations and in people. So that's probably me in a nutshell. Um, that's what that's what makes Larry uniquely Larry. Right. So was there something in your childhood or going through high school that made you this way? Boy, you want to get right into it fast, don't you, dude? Um, so I think on the outside, looking into Larry's life, you know, I grew up in this what appeared to be kind of like Mayberry RFD, this cute little town. But there was a lot of pain uh, in my family and in my upbringing. And I learned to cover a lot of the pain by being a peacekeeper and um, having a smile on my face and pretending everything was sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows when behind the scenes there was some ugliness in my life. And I was joking around with Matt about that. Matt and I had dinner. Matt Shad, we had mentioned earlier had um, dinner together, I don't know, a year and a half ago when he was here in town. And I was having this conversation with another buddy of mine who was also in special forces. And we, we all had agreed that I don't know anyone who's been successful in the special operations community who has probably not got some emotional brokenness before they go in <laughs> and some stuff to prove. And so don't we all carry a lot of baggage with us from our upbringings, from high school? I, I don't know anyone not, that's not true. Most people I know struggled through their high school and young adult life because nobody really teaches us how to do that. Right. I mean, I've got two teenage children. I've got a 19 year old daughter and a 16 year old son. And I've watched the struggles that they've had. And I, and I like to think that their mom and I um, have worked through a lot of our own issues and passed on the tools to help them become great young adults. But we've all got struggles. Right. So because I didn't have people who were cheerleaders in my life, I, and I recognized that words have meaning, there's power in words. I had promised myself when I at a young age that when I was able to have some kind of influence, that I was going to do things a little bit differently. And I was going and I, part of it is, I think, a gifting. I have a way of recognizing potential in people. But I'll share with you just a really quick little story that might give you insight into this. I barely graduated high school. You know, like literally barely graduated high school. Now, as it turns out, I'm dyslexic. I didn't know that until I got into the military. But, you know, here in in the States, it's like grade eight or something like that. Or when you get into high school, you go meet with a guidance counselor and they say, well, what do you want to do? when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? So that they can start scheduling the classes for you, right? And I went and sat down with this guidance counselor, and she asked me that question. And um, I said, well, I want to be a veterinarian. And she chuckled, literally, like right in my face, just laughed and said, honey, you're not smart enough to be a veterinarian. No. But if you want to work with animals, we can get you into Future Farmers of America, and you can work with animals that way. And when somebody who is an authority and you're just a young kid at that point who says you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you don't have what it takes, you kind of believe them. And I didn't have other people in my life either, with the exception of a wrestling coach, Dutch Sturdivant, who kind of saw potential in me. And when he was encouraging, I real and I had a scout master, I was in Boy Scouts as well, who would speak words of encouragement as well. But there weren't like close family members, there weren't teachers who were speaking positivity into my life. So I understood the power of it. And so that's try to that's how I try to live my life with our team members and our and, and the companies that I'm involved with and with anybody with my children. I try to be a positive voice. Now, don't get me wrong, I speak the truth as well. If somebody's falling short. Um, I speak the truth in love. And the way I couch it is, hey, I'm invested. I'm interested in you reaching your fullest potential in this area or this action is not going to get you there. But I don't, I try not to beat the snot out of people. I try to be encouraging. So you're the head coach and cheerleader. I try to be, yeah. You know, I had, um, I was doing a podcast recently and they introduced me as like, 
this amazing thought leader, you know, and in my head is like, I'm, I'm not a thought leader. I'm a cheerleader. <laughs> you know, the things that I share with people, is, I mean, some of it's my own, but usually I'm just regurgitating what I've learned along the way at, from other people. I'm a big believer in having mentors and mentoring people. And so I, after that podcast, I really put some thought into it and said, no, I'm not a thought leader. I, I'm a cheerleader. I'm a cheerleader for the planet. I'm a cheerleader for entrepreneurs. I'm a cheerleader for capitalism. I'm a cheerleader for leaders. I'm a cheerleader for lovers and definitely a cheerleader for the truth. So kind of my religion is truth <laughs> right, right now. Are there any books that you could recommend on you know, learning more about cheerleading? Let's see, Henry Cloud uh, and John Townsend wrote a couple of books. Um, I'll have to think about that. Maybe it'll come to me. Uh, but on cheerleading, I think that if we just do some of the hard work on ourselves, there's a good book called um, Man's Quest for Meaning. Or is that it? Man's Quest for No, 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 no. It's uh, Man's Man's Search for Meaning. There you go. Yeah, yes, Man's Search for me. Meaning yeah. by Henry by 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 Frankel, right? Yeah, yeah. When we read more books like that, that talks about the human struggle and the triumph that we have over our struggles, it, it opens our eyes a little bit, right? So I'm working on a book right now. It's a book of parables that I think is going to help this because oftentimes we want to speak positivity into other people's lives. I think mostly we do. I don't think most people want to speak negativity into people's lives, but we don't know how to do it. And I am a big believer that transformational leaders have to be master storytellers. And so to do that, we have to know what stories to tell and when and how to do it. And so it's a book of parables. Well, why parables? Well, because parables have been used for centuries to pass on wisdom and learning and, and knowledge before the written word ever happened. We were telling stories, right? And you probably heard this, what, that facts tell, stories sell. And if you're a leader, really, you're selling constantly. You're selling a vision, right? You're selling how things could be. And so some of them are my parables and stories that I've come up with along the way and others are brief little stories and parables that you've heard like Aesop's fables and those kinds of things. And then I actually will give a little take on what that parable means. I think we may have got sidetracked there a little bit, but I do think that uh, there are plenty of books. I, I am an avid reader and I've learned that in most books, there's, they're filled with fluff. Not mine, of course, not my books, <laughs> of course. But what I try to do, like I've learned that maybe 20% of a book that I read is really valuable and the rest is just filling, filling in spaces, right? But if we look at books and, and any interaction that we have with someone, like if I can take away one golden nugget from this interaction that I'm having with a barista at Starbucks or one golden nugget from the, the gate agent at, at the airport when I'm boarding a plane, um, we learn a lot more from that than we do from any semester sitting through a college course that I've ever been to, right? But we have to be intentional about it, Norm. And we have to say, I'm looking for the good. This is a message I've been sharing with my children for years. You find what you're looking for. If you're looking for the negativity in life, you're looking for the bad, you're going to see the negativity and the bad stuff. But if you're looking for the positivity in life, you're looking for the little miracles that happen each and every day, that's what you're going to see. Can't agree more. So yeah. when you do that, then I think there's there's lessons everywhere, lessons everywhere, all around us. Well, you got to send us a link to that book when it gets published. Oh, I will. I will. Great. So let's go back to so you, you're out of high school and you're you went right into the army right after high school. No, I took a little bit of judo when I was in junior high school. Secretly, my parents didn't even even know. And then I wrestled in high school. And then I started working at my twin brother and I and our friend Jack got an apartment when we were 17 years old. We all wanted to get out of our, our houses. And while I was still in, uh, I think I might have been a senior in high school, I got a job at McDonald's and flipped burgers for a living. And that afforded me the ability to get an apartment with my you know brother and our other roommate. 
And so I did that for a couple of years. I went into the military when I was 19 and a half, I think it was. I was almost 20. I think I turned 20 that, that summer. So it was really um, an interesting way I got into the military. I, my brother and I, went, we lived in New York at the time, came out to California to a national martial arts tournament. And it was there that I had heard that the Army was going to be sponsoring the first uh, U.S. Taekwondo team for the Olympics for, in 1984. And I thought, ah, hey, Norm, that's my ticket out of Podunk, New York, out of small town in U- USA. I'm going to get on the Army Taekwondo team. And so when I got back, I went down to talk to the Army recruiter and told them I want to be on the Army Taekwondo team. And this is why I need to be on the Army Taekwondo team. And by the way, I didn't even study Taekwondo. <laughs> I, I studied a style called Wu Yin Yang Jing. It's similar to Taekwondo. It looked like Taekwondo, but it, but it wasn't. But that tells you how my brain works, right? If somebody else can do it, I can do it. How hard can it be, right? And so after a few minutes of me doing this full-on full court press, this army recruiter put his hand up and said, son, you know that if you want to be on the army Taekwondo team, you have to be in the army. For some reason, it it didn't register. Um, Had I mentioned yet that I barely graduated high school? Um, (laughs) It just didn't register. I thought that they sponsored it, right? But he did talk me into taking the ASVAB, which is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, which is basically an aptitude and IQ test. The apartment that we were in was a couple blocks away from the recruiter's office. And a couple of days later, he called and said, hey, uh, Larry, why don't you come down? I want to talk to you about your your uh, your ASVAB scores. And I really thought that I felt like I was walking to the principal's office. That was like the longest two blocks in my life. I thought, well, here's one more thing I tried to get it to do. And I, and I couldn't couldn't do it. But I walked in and sat down and he said, you know, you score in the top one tenth of one percentile in the country. You can basically do whatever you, want, whatever you want to do in the Army. In fact, son, they like calling you son, I think. Well, because, you know, I had dad issues, right? I was, they were looking for a sense of, they, they knew that, that this could be my new family, right? And he said, son, um, you could even try out for special forces. And just the way he said it, I thought, yeah, that sounds awesome. What special forces? I didn't even know. I didn't even know what Special Forces was, but he had me, you know, hooked. And he said, you know, the Green Berets. And I still didn't know who he was talking about. And he said, you know, John Wayne, the Green Berets. And I kind of heard that, like there's a piece of artwork in my office with John Wayne, the Green Berets. Um, And then he said, like, Billy Jack, the Green Berets. And then, ah, okay, I know Billy Jack. And that summer, a movie was coming out called Rambo. It hadn't come out yet. And um, I did a delayed entry program. So this must have been 1983. And so that, that movie came out and he said, Rambo. So you might want to watch that when it comes out. And so I said, yeah, okay, sign me up. So I signed up for that, went through basic training and uh, jumps, you know, airborne school and went and tried out, did really well. And I was assigned to 10th Special Forces Group, the original, the first Special Forces Group that was ever developed here in the U.S. And from there, I spent between active duty and the reserve, I spent about eight and a half years on Special Forces A teams, and it was the most phenomenal experience uh, in my life. And it was there that I learned the power of small elite teams who believe in the same vision, the the power of camaraderie, and uh, you know those bonds run very deep. And it's been thirty some years since I was ever in, but it's still the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. So that's where you got your grit from. That was well, I think I had grit before that. I, I really do. And, and I kind of equate it to, you know, right now people are talking about, you, you've heard this, right? I mean, uh, Canadians have the same kind of way that they describe the World War II generation. You know, the men and women that went off to World War II from Canada and the U.S. and the Allied forces, they call them the greatest generations, right? Because they came back and rebuilt America and they rebuilt Canada because, you know, many people were gone off to war. Well, if you think about it here in the U.S., it's, I, don't, I don't think it was that they went off to war, to World War II, to fight the, the access. I, I think it was they just finished up with the Great Depression. The men that went off to fight World War II grew up 
during a very difficult time. They were already tough before they went off to World War II. One of the first mantras that I had heard in the Special Forces, my team daddy had said this, that he said, you know, tough times create tough men. Tough men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. Weak men create tough times. So it's kind of the cycle, right? Tough times create tough people, right? And so I grew up in a tough environment. Again, this is the conversation I'm having with my children right now because we are in a tough time, economically, politically, socially. And although it feels like we're getting uh, getting getting beat up right now, it's like when you go to the gym, you don't get strong if you don't push yourself, if you don't get bloodied, you don't get bruised, you don't stretch yourself. And right now, that's what's happening to uh, across most of the world. And I believe that this this tough time that we're going through right now is going to make for a very beautiful result, I think, on the other side. I really, really do. If we play our cards right, we don't do some pretty stupid stuff. And we can get into that if, if, if you want. But I, I believe that we're going to head into a new roaring 20s, like, uh, like we saw 100 years ago uh, after the Spanish flu. I do. So let's get into that a little bit. So we're, we, I agree. We're in a tough time. I, I'm seeing people that are crawling up in the fetal position and crying. And I'm seeing people rise up and just going forward. So I, I am interested to hear what you have to say about what's going on right now and where we're going. Well, I am fearful. Listen, I've traveled to not as much as some, probably not as much as Matt Shad, who's one of the most amazing travelers I've ever met. And you probably experienced that. But I've been to about 42 different, at least 42 different countries, many socialist countries, many communist countries, and I am a firm believer in capitalism. I'm a firm believer in democracies, whether it's a representative democracy or, or not, or a republic. I believe, well, it's because I believe in human potential. I believe in the human condition. I know that there is good and bad in, in all of us. And so I think that if we play our cards right, that those people that are rising up, who have been kind of the silent, strong types, if they win then I think it could be good for all of us across North America. The problem, I think, is that there are a lot of people who don't, don't understand history or geography. And so there's blanket answers for a lot of things. But I don't, I don't know. Uh, we could talk about this, I suppose. I don't know a socialist country that has been successful. I think that Marxism and socialism, um, there's a lot of death and suffering there. And with all of the flaws that we have here in the States, uh, I don't know a country that aspires to do more great things than, than the U.S. And, um, I mean, we've got, we're the only country in the world that has a First Amendment, right? Freedom of speech. It's in our Constitution. <laughs> we're allowed to speak up. Canada didn't even have a First Amendment, I mean, a, a freedom of speech, right? This part of their Constitution. No. And I think that we're very unique. But I don't, we don't have a right to destroy other people's property. We don't have a right to prevent people from making a living. And so I think that's where the struggle is coming in here in, in the U.S. But there's a, I think there's a mass awakening across the globe right now, whether we're talking about Taiwan or here in the U.S. There are people who want liberty. They want freedom. But with both liberty and freedom comes responsibility. That's the, that's the scary part. There's a lot of... We've had... It's been easy for so long here in the U.S. in particular. What does what do easy times create? Weak people, right? This is why we've got to be bubble wrapped. You know, we, we we're, we're too soft, and we become. It's become so easy that by a word we become offended by a silly word that there's really no meaning, right? That scares me. But I do believe. Again, I believe that there are more people out there who understand this and are willing to stand up against it than the, the small minority of people who are willing to burn, burn the shit down, um, excuse me for swearing, but burn it all down and start over. I've been to countries where they've tried to burn it all down and start over. I don't want that. I don't. I've been to South America. I've been to Central America. I've been through almost 20 countries on the African continent, or at least a dozen countries across the African continent. Burning it down and starting over is an ugly way to do it. We're, neither Canada nor the U.S. nor most of the Western world 
deserves to be burned down to start over. I think we can do great things right where we are. Have I offended you, Norm? What's not? It takes a lot to offend me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm an old guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's funny because uh, I used to hear this all the time. It was from blue collar to white collar to blue collar. And it was, you know, you, you, had, you, you had the dad that worked hard and, you know, built up something to pass it on to their son or daughter and they just let it fall. And then their kids, sorry, Hayden, had to pick it up and build it all over again. And, uh, you know, it, it's really true. Like what you said, I mean, it is a full circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I... I think that our education system here in the U.S. has failed us. I can't speak for Canada because I, I don't know, but I do think in the U.S. It, it has failed us. If we were teaching, I'm going to use this word intentionally because this is what I've seen. I can only based on my experience and my education and reading and talking to people who have been there. I don't think we speak enough to the evils of socialism and Marxism. I just don't think we do. For somehow we've romanticized this thing that everything's going to be sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. But they don't talk about the grayness of, of mediocrity. And they don't talk about... There, there's a great meme that, that goes around, that is floating around the, the internet, that showed... This, it was two contrasts. One is the joys of being a socialist in a capitalist country and, the, and how it really is being a socialist in a socialist country. It's completely different, right? I want us to change our education system. It scares the living Jesus out of me that people are talking about, let's stop teaching history until we get it right, until we figure out, you know, how we're really going to teach history. Um, Hello, that is not the answer. Literally, we have legislators here in the U.S., in Chicago, who are saying we need to stop teaching history in schools. What do they say about history? When you stop teaching history, it's bound to repeat itself, right? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So, but again, I do, I'm the optimist. I do believe that it's going to get better. I do. I think there's people like you and me, I don't know about your political stuff or any of that, like that but you're, you are offering people a platform to speak up, right? This is what I love about your show. And I love about podcasting right now. There is a new media. Um, there's so many ways to get the word out, get your message out nowadays. And it's not just through, I mean, when I was growing up, we had ABC, NBC, and CBS. Where I lived, we got two, we didn't even get three, we got two because we were very rural, right? And it was black and white TV, right? It just seems like there's, it's so one-sided, whether it's Fox News or MSNBC, you don't get anything in between. I'm a big believer in diversity of thought and I hate toxic tribalism. And I think that's what's plaguing us right now is that, it's not my tribe good, your tribe bad. Again, I go back to yin and yang. There's good and bad in all of us. There's not, you know, capitalism is not pure. There's evil people everywhere, right? But we can share ideas. And that's what I just love about the whole podcasting medium is that we can get out there and just share ideas. And we don't need to get into battle. We can just have conversations and just, you know, and see what we need, need to say. I, I mean, I can't think of the very few things I would not let somebody say out loud but i better have a good enough argument to talk about and give another counter point of view right but i'm not i don't think it's right to just shut somebody down just because they don't say what you think they ought to be saying that's as bad that's evil i think i've been thinking about this recently just given uh the covid situation like where's the line for you between uh like the government helping in a time like this and providing you know checks for people to get by and then where socialism tips too far? Yeah, boy, that's a great question. Um, so my company went from having a, a record year last year and heading for another record year this year to being shut down by the government. It wasn't COVID. It wasn't entrepreneurs who said, hey, we need to shut it down. It was the government, particularly here in California. We're shutting it down. And so by no fault of my own, my revenue for my company, you know, went to 10% of what it was the year before. I still have the obligations to pay team members. I still have the obligations to pay mortgages. 
pay insurance, you know, pay for vendors. So I do think that the government needed to step in in a temporary fashion to do that. The, the problem comes in is that there's so much conflicting information right now about the whole COVID crisis, particularly here in the U.S., and sadly it is spread out across the globe with uh, the way the whole George Floyd thing has been handled. Um, I mean, crying out loud, what they're doing protests in Germany with George Floyd signs, right? That tells you the impact of this whole situation, right? So there is an obligation that the government must have, but we're, really I'm a, I'm a free market for the most part kind of guy. What we should have done is educate the people and say, hey, cause we, we've known all along about uh, COVID, right? Early on, we knew that um, it's really the infirm, the elderly that are most impacted by this. And if those people want to, or they should stay home and let the healthy people get out there and work and keep the, keep the economy going. There's a debate right now, Hayden, in, in the U.S. about what do we do about mask, wearing a mask, right? Because there are a lot of municipalities uh, who are, quote unquote, requiring everyone to wear a mask in public spaces. But this is a country that was built on freedom and liberty, right? And you educate people and they make the decision. Where does that, because it's not a law, but they are, an executive order is not a law. It's a requ- they're requiring. Where does that requirement impinge on someone's civil liberty, right? And so there are a lot of big organizations like Walmart and Home Depot and Lowe's, and I could list, you know, a half dozen of them pretty quickly here, who first came out and said, we are requiring, if you're going to come into our store, you have to wear a mask. Well, then you got civil libertarians who are saying, you're not going to force me to wear a mask. And so then what ended up happening? Conflict, fist fights, people were getting shot, right? And so then these companies said, well, listen, we need to keep our people safe as well, that they're not getting beat up. We're saying, hey, we want you to wear one. We're not going to force you to wear one when you're in our store. And so we're, hey, we're in, a hotel in, in the hotel industry, and uh, one of our hotels is a brand. And uh, so we have, and the brand is saying, hey, everyone w- must wear a mask. So what we're doing is we are requiring if you are a worker, if you're a team member in our company while you're at work, while you're working, you have to wear the, the, the protective gear, right, the PPE kind of stuff. But I am not going to, under any circumstance, if, um, have one of my team members get into a battle with someone who does not want to wear a mask because just like I want, I have to protect them from the virus, I have to protect them from getting a gun pulled on them as well or getting into a fight. It's a tough time right now. These are This is the, the stuff that real leaders are made of. You, we got to make the tough decisions right now. It's not all sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, right? Um, and life is about nuance. Life is about living in the gray areas sometimes. It's not all black and white all the time. Um, people want to make it black and white, but it's not. It's just not. I just thought of a great new podcast, The Rise of the Karens. Oh, The Rise of the Karens. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. That would be funny. There would be a lot. It would be sad in some ways, but, boy, it could be funny, too. <laughs> <laughs> The rise of the Karen. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you're in a tough position, um, you know, being in the hospitality industry. I mean, first of all, is it coming back? Are you starting to see people come back? Well, it was, you know, until the George Floyd situation. Um, we were thinking it was going to be a V recovery because Americans are known to be travelers, right? Now, it's a huge country like Canada, so a lot of people travel inside our own borders, but a lot of people come here as well. So we've got some of our hotels that are still closed um, because there's there's not the demand for them. Um, Leisure hotels in markets like Santa Barbara or Santa Monica, or, you know, if it's a, where there are leisure travelers and there's a easy drive market to get there. Yeah. We're seeing some, some recovery. In fact, uh, we had some hotels and in July that did about, you know, mid 60% occupancy. Now it's not the mid 80% that it was last year. The rate is down. People aren't paying the same amount, but people are traveling where they can. But you've got some cities like Chicago that won't even allow, if you're from California, you can't even fly into Chicago without going into quarantine for two weeks. So again, it depends on the, it really depends on the market, right? But if you live within a couple hour radius of Chicago, you can drive to Chicago. 
but there are some states where you, where you just can't. So it, it is coming back. But again, we've got a handful of hotels that aren't even open right now. What I don't think is going to come back very quickly, certainly not the convention business. That's not going to come back for a while where, you know, you have thousands of people who come to a convention center and they stay at area hotels. Uh, I think we'll see a little bit of corporate business come back maybe after the first of the year. And that's just kind of the individual traveler who's traveling on business. Right. But I don't think convention business is going to come back for a while. So Hayden is a professional musician and we talk about it and what happens? No bars. You can't get together and gig. You know, it, it's, it's just crumbled. It, it, you don't realize how much all of this has affected everybody. I think everybody does realize it, but it's crazy. It is crazy. I've got a lot of friends who are musicians and comedians and it's the conversation constantly. Like, what do you do? Like, I, this is me personally. I think that music and comedy are essential. You turn to comedy, you turn to music and, and gyms and workout facilities as well. Right. We're, we're not, what do we, this is where I think we're just missing it as leaders. What's our answer. I'll put a mask on. Really? Is anyone talking about boosting your immune system? Is anyone talking about remaining positive? Is anybody talking about that? How about spirituality? That's an important element too, you know, but no, what are we, what are they saying? Put a mask on. They're not talking about supplements or exercise or, you know, having a spirit of gratitude. It's going to be scary on the other side of this when they measure the amount of suicides that have been caused by this. You know, that, that's a, that's a fantastic point. And another one, and Hayden's going to cringe because I know he always cringes when I say this, but how about a 30 second video to show you how to wear a mask? So we had to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, in, in our company, because we see so many people wearing it down here or, you know, on their chin or whatever it is, does you no good if it's not here. And so we did. We have signs in all of our hotels for all of our team members. And by the way, I've said this a couple of times. We call our people team members and employees for a reason. We can talk about that later if you want. But we did. We wanted to make sure that people, for their own freaking health, you know, to, to properly wear the darn thing. So a 30, I haven't seen those. If this is so important, why aren't there public service announcements about how to wear it? That's what I've been saying. So, Hayden, you might roll your eyes. But Larry yeah, agrees. I'm on your side with that. <laughs> Just walking around Montreal, I mean, it's it's scary how some people think having it here <laughs> is doing yeah. anything, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that it's not just uh, us simple Americans who are wearing them on their chin, you know, <laughs> that you're seeing it in sophisticated, you know, uh, <laughs> Montreal, too. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got to ask you, so you've got – these hotels that were running, you know, hundred percent, this happens. You always hear about, Oh, you know, smart entrepreneurs always have a slush fund for the bad day in the good times, put it in the bank and the bad times spend it. How do you survive something like this, especially, you know, in the hotel business? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and of course we did. We've got what we call, you know, working capital reserves, right? The average company in the U.S. has 27 days worth of capital reserve, 27 days. That's the average. So some have more, many have less, right? But when you develop your working capital reserve, you never, I don't know anybody who predicts, okay, I'm going to go into three months of zero revenue. Even when you have your working capital reserve, you assume, okay, we generally run 80% this time of year. What's the worst? Let's say that it cuts out. Let's say you got 40%. That's worst case scenario, right? Um, but nobody predicts that you're going to go to zero revenue for an extended period of time, right? So unless you were, you were in the medical device industry or you had online, you were an online retailer or a grocery store, here in the U.S., they were saying um, that no industry has been hurt as bad as the hospitality industry. When you add in airlines, hotels, you know, the related service industries that serve the traveler no one's been hurt as bad as the hotel industry because of this and when you consider that the hotel industry is not just a service industry it's a real estate business too right we have these big buildings that we have to pay mortgages on and uh guess what 
the banks are still knocking at the door because they want to be paid. And yeah, some you know, we're still negotiating with some of the banks. We're still trying to get forbearance on a couple of the hotels. Some were easier to work with than others, and some weren't willing to work with at all. Others, we were blessed that we've got very little debt on them. And so we've, you know, continued on as if nothing happened, except that we aren't distributing, you know, cash flow or distributions to those those assets. But it really is kind of a really wide range of challenges that have been pre- presented here. So that's a really great question, Norm, about cash flow, about working capital reserve, because most people don't have it. So what have I learned? Um, I can tell you that we've got some hotels that we're trying to acquire now and one that's actually under construction. In one scenario, I have planned for 12 months of working capital reserve. 12 months. That's a lot of money that you got to, that I'm planning on. We're just going to put it aside and we tap into it in case, case we need it. In the old days, it might be three months worth, right? But right now, I'm planning on worst case scenarios, you know? And if it works, great. And if, if the deal doesn't work, then it doesn't work. Hey there, guys and gals. That concludes part one of our interview with Larry Broughton. Make sure to tune in next time for the rest of the interview. And as always, make sure to subscribe to the podcast. It keeps you up to date with every new episode and helps us grow our show. So see you next time.